Church on this second Sunday of the new year. How are you feeling today? Are you happy you made it to church today? Okay, I hope you're off to a good start for 2024. You know, over the years in January, right after the start of a new year, oftentimes people ask me, Pastor, what do you see for the next 12 months? Has God been showing you anything? What do you think God has in store for us? What's your gut feeling? And unless uh, the Lord is leading me uh, spiritually with some kind of a prompting or uh, some kind of a direction, I typically respond to those kinds of questions, questions about the future the same way. I say God has not revealed anything overly dramatic to me. I, I just be honest. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are making all kinds of predictions. And sometimes we as Christians, we feed off of that. We love the prophetic. I guess we all like to think that we have the inside track. But again, unless the Lord is making something crystal clear to me, I don't shoot from the hip and hope I hit the target somewhere. I'm a center of the bullseye kind of a guy. And besides that, God has not called me to the office of prophet to stand up here and predict the future. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 40 years. And as such, my main responsibility is to watch over your soul, to pray for you, and to lead you to the life-changing Word of God. Uh, and so we're, we're going to continue to do that again this year. And having said all that, if you've been around the church any length of time here at Community Christian, you know in January, I always put my optimistic hat on and I tell you that God has a good plan for you this year. Just like we sung about this morning. He has good plans for us. For the past 32 years, we're coming up on our 32-year anniversary in just a couple of weeks, and all during those years, when we get around to January, I tell you, I encourage you, that this year, right now, 2024, has the potential to be an exceptional year. Much better than the year before. If you want it to be. God will grace us with everything necessary for us to have a good year. And that's a prophetic word that I cannot fail on. Because even if the year ends up being what we would describe as a bad year, how many of you know God is still in control? He's still on the throne, and he's still at work. Let's take last year, for instance. Last year was a tough year. It was a challenging year. There was a lot of death in 2024. It seemed like every time I turned around, the church was hosting a funeral. In my own little world, the people that I know and love, many of them lost family members and friends. Some were even tragic. Last year, I buried my 63-year-old brother, my younger brother. And his untimely death, which came out of nowhere, took me by surprise, messed me up. If I'm honest, I slipped into a month-long depression which is unusual territory for me. Because typically, I bounce right back. You've heard me say this on several occasions. I will give myself a full 24 hours to get it together, you know, to climb out of my uh, little pity party. But this took a lot longer. And it took me a while to grieve my brother's death. But even with the prolonged emotional pain that is still to, yet to fully heal, even with the threat of war, the bad economy, the inflation, the moral decline, our dark culture that we're in right now, I would not define a year by a single event, tragedy, or incident. And so overall, when I look at 2023, it was a good year. Why? Because God led us through. He carried us through. As difficult as it was at times, God 
did not bail on us. He sustained us. He provided for us. He did not break covenant with us. And don't look now, but by the grace of God, we're still standing. We're here to enter into another new year. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19, Paul said this, if in this life only, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men and all women most miserable. Friends, I sure hope you're not putting all of your dreams, all of your hopes and expectations into what this world has to offer. I trust that you can see beyond this place and time and you can understand that what's destined for us is a tremendous other reality. It's called eternity. And so as we enter into 2024, I do believe that God has impressed upon me a prophetic leading. And just to make the distinction, uh, this is not a prediction about the future, but rather the prophetic word of the Lord. The word of the Lord for today. And here it is. You ready? As we enter into 2024, God wants us healthy. I'm going to say it again. God wants us healthy in every dimension of life, spirit, soul, and body. Now, if you're with us last week, you know that Pastor Chris started a brand new first of the year series entitled Loving the One in the Mirror. And the goal of the series is soul care. To make an assessment, honest and sincere assessment of where we are with us, where you are with you, and in the process improve every dimension of your life. This series is not about um, self-care. It's not about um, self-sufficiency or self-help or sneaking in or squeezing in a little bit more me time. Here at the beginning of 2024, we're going after the two greatest commandments in the Word of God. Namely, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, might, and strength, and the second commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responded to the questions of the religious leaders and said, these are the two most powerful commandments that God has ever given to us. Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that. These are his words. And then in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 40, he adds this. Jesus said all the law and the prophets, everything God has ever said to us in his word, hangs on these two commandments. How many of you think that's pretty important? Everything that God taught us, everything that God wants for us and has instructed us to do in his word, hangs on those two commandments. And the thought here is, if we can hit the sweet spot in our relationship with God and in the process receive a healthier understanding of how God designed us and how he wired us, then maybe, just maybe, we can accept and embrace who we are. We can feel good about who we are. And with that kind of personal confidence and assurance, quite possibly we can do a little better job with the love God and the love others piece which is really the basis and the paradigm of Christianity. Again, the two great commandments, love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. All right, with that as my introduction, today I want to talk about control. That's my assignment for today, to talk to you about the subject of control. Can I get you to say that, please? Control. One more time. Control, C-O-N-T-R-O-L, control. And whether you're willing to admit it or not, we all have a human need to experience control in our lives. We all do. And that's a far cry from some people who would fall into the category of control freaks. Keep your elbow to yourself. 
And right about now, if you're thinking, yeah, sure, I like to call the shots, but no way in the world am I a control freak, if that's what you're thinking, then you probably are one. And I say that because according to the experts, the number one characteristic of having control issues is denial. Refusing to admit or acknowledge it. I mean, let's be honest. We're in church, right? We should be honest in church. Most of us enjoy being in control. And even with all of our angelic and godly humility, we love the position of having the upper hand and getting our own way. We all love that. And without becoming overly clinical here, according to psychology today, our push for control is one of humanity's greatest needs. Check this out. It has been repeatedly argued by the experts that the perception of control is not only desirable, it is a physical and emotional necessity, like we have to have it. And so therefore, when we lose control, when we feel forced or compelled to act or behave in a certain way, where we don't have the freedom to make our own choices, that can lead to a lot of frustration and a whole slew of unhealthy emotions. Wonderful friendships, amazing and loving marriage relationships have been destroyed because of control issues. Abuse of power and control has torn families and businesses and churches and communities and neighborhoods apart and even nations apart. And so is this thing that we call control, is it a terrible thing? Is it ungodly, something that we should avoid at all costs? No, in all actuality, control is a God-given gift. But like so many of the other blessings that the Lord passes along to us, we have to learn a healthy balance between control and surrender. And this is what the Word of God teaches us. Control can create some problems, but control is also something that God is asking us to do. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul said, I discipline my body and I keep it under control. I maintain control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Here in this passage, Paul is promoting control. He comes right out and tells us exercising control and good management and taking charge is a good thing for us to do. God wants us to have control. He wants us to control our emotions. He wants us to control our temper, our physical appetites, our fleshly desires. These are all things that God is asking us to take stock of and to control. But here's where it gets really tricky. When you read the Word of God, when you understand the, the message of the Bible on this particular subject, be, because for a, a believer, healthy control, listen to this, healthy control includes full surrender to God. Thank you, Therese, appreciate that. When we think about control, as a believer, it includes full surrender. I know it doesn't make sense. But from a biblical standpoint, having control is giving up control. Say that. Having control is giving up control. If we desire to grasp this subject matter and to understand the way that God designed and created us, then we need to realize that when God passes along control to us, it also includes surrender to him. And in order to do that, in order to make this work and to learn what surrender is all about, as Christians, we have to be willing to take some things off and to put some things on. 
We have to assess our lives, take a look at who we are, and in the process be willing to take some things off and to put some things on. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Verses 5 through 14. I'm not going to read all the verses here. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. In other words, take these things off. Anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of your creator. Verse 12, put on then, right, we took some things off, then Paul says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive, and above all these things, put on love. Do what now? Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. All right, here in Colossians chapter 3, who is Paul writing to? He's writing to believers. He's writing to Christians. And he says to this group of Christians in Colossae, wonderful church. He said there was a time when you used to live differently than you're supposed to live right now. In fact, you live like the Gentiles. You made some bad decisions. You let your flesh uh, rule your day. You know, sometimes you cuss people out. You drop some bombs. You, you know, you, 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 you drank too much. You, you got into arguments with people. You lost your temper. You used to do those things. In fact, you used to live like the devil. Stop doing that. Paul says, stop doing that. Now, now, why would Paul say to a church body, stop doing that? Because they were doing it still. They were still living the exact same way. They had fall, fallen into some bad habits, and they weren't able to break those habits. And so Paul admonishes the church here in Colossae. He says, instead of allowing your flesh to control you, instead of allowing all of these human natural passions to control you. Let the Spirit of God control you. Take some of those things off, put some good things on, and let the Word of God, let the grace of God, let the Spirit of God change you and remake you into the kind of person that God wants you to be. Let God control those things now instead of you. Now, while you think about that just for a moment, I want to quickly look at two main physical resurrection miracles that are recorded in the Gospels, okay? There's a few more than just the two, but the two that I want to look at uh, is the resurrection miracle involving Lazarus. That's recorded in John chapter 11 when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. You remember that one, right? And then the other one is his own. Uh, the events that happened after Good Friday on Easter Sunday when Jesus was raised from the dead. And I know, you know, you, we have Bible scholars out there and you're going to tell me that we have more resurrections than just those two, and I, I know it. Uh, there are two others listed in the Gospels. There's the widow from Nain, N-A-I-N, who lost her only son. Um, he died and they carried him out of the city. Remember, Jesus was passing through the village. He stops the funeral procession, he lays his hand on the sick man, and that man comes back to life again, the widow's son. And then there was Jairus' daughter. Remember, she was sick. Jairus asked Jesus if he would come to his house. On his way, he got hung up with this gal who had a bleeding issue, been bleeding for 12 years. Jesus stopped to minister to this woman, and when he did, the young girl died. But then Jesus continued on his way to Jairus' house, and he raised that little 12-year-old girl from the dead. So we have the four resurrections 
in the Gospels. There's a couple of other ones in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But the two that I want to focus in on for just a few minutes this morning is the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead and Jesus' own resurrection. And as I read these two accounts, we're going to look at them uh, in the scripture. As I read them, I want you to uh, see if you can pick out the main difference in these two stories. Okay, so a little challenge here. You're going to have to pay attention. Don't scroll on your phone and look like you're, you know, following along on your phone or whatever. Pay attention, okay? All right, first one. Lazarus, found in John chapter 11, beginning with verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, that was the sister of the dead man, sister of Lazarus, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there, he's been dead four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. All right, that was story number one, the Lazarus miracle. Here comes resurrection story number two. Are you with me? All right. John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone that had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and... We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I guess John was a little faster. Uh, and he bent over and looked in the, into the tomb and at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and he believed. All right, that's good right there. Were you paying attention? I believe you were. So were you able to acknowledge or come up with the main difference in these two stories? In the first story with Lazarus, after he came out of the tomb, after Jesus raised him from the dead, what did he look like? He was a walking mummy. The scripture says that his hands and his legs were still wrapped with the grave clothes as the linen was around his head. So he came out of the tomb, resurrected by Jesus. He came walking out of the tomb with his grave clothes on. But when Jesus came out of the tomb, did he have grave clothes on? No, he did not. Because the scripture tells us that when John and Peter went inside the tomb, they saw the strips that were wrapped around his body and around his head. They were laying there. Everything was kept there in the tomb. Jesus didn't take the grave clothes out of the tomb with him. I want you to listen to me this next statement very carefully because this will sum up everything that I'm trying to communicate to you. In fact, if you get this, then you've heard everything. We cannot maintain control of the Christian life with grave clothes on. We're talking about control, friends. Talking about the way that God designed us, the way that he created us and wired us, and how we're supposed to live, and how we're supposed to address this whole issue of control. How we live our lives, the decisions we make. We cannot 
maintain control as believers with grave clothes on. You see, once you become a Christian, once you understand and you receive a revelation of Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, when you are able to understand that he went to the cross and died, he's the Savior of the world, and he's your Savior, everything changes in your life. Friend, everything changes from a spiritual standpoint. You're still the same person. You still have the same passions. You still have the same desires. But everything in the eternal realm has changed. The scripture says you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When we come out of the grave, so to speak, spiritually, the grave clothes have got to remain in the tomb. We have to be willing to come out without the grave clothes. And when I say you have to take the grave clothes off, that means you have to be willing to walk away from the past on every level. You have to be willing to put the past behind you, including the bad habits and bad behavior that you still currently have, along with all the mistakes and failures that you have already made that you can't do anything about. As badly as you try to fix them, you're not going to be able to fix them. You see, when it comes to understanding a healthy balance between control and surrender, what I want you to grasp and understand is that your greatest challenge is not your spouse, it's not your boss, your pastor, nosy neighbor, or some other annoying person. In fact, contrary to what you may think, it's not even you. Your biggest adversary and nemesis is the voice of darkness, Satan himself. And so many believers today have allowed the devil to be a powerful influence in their lives when it comes to control. The decisions that they make, the choices from day to day, are influenced by this demonic voice that we keep hearing over and over again. And remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 44? He identified Satan as a liar. Can I get you to understand that the enemy of our souls, the one that prowls about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour, he is a liar? Jesus also identified him as the father of all lies. That's his native language, lies and deception. And trust me when I tell you, he's good at it. He's been doing it for a long time. And when we lack discernment and we allow the enemy to lie to us and we believe his lies, he has the power and the control over us. So you can be on top of the world one day. You, you could be walking along, living life, and everything is going great for you. And all of a sudden, the devil comes to you uh, with a fleshly temptation. And you know that you shouldn't be involved in that. You shouldn't be doing that. And right about the time that you are desperately trying to draw from the grace and the strength of God to stop any potential failure or wrongdoing, here comes the devil yapping in your ear. Every time. Whenever you are hit with a temptation, remember, we all face temptation. Even Jesus faced temptation. He had to go into the wilderness before he started his earthly ministry so that he could deal with this whole thing called temptation. We get bombarded with temptation each and every day. And right around the time that we're ready to draw from the grace of God and, and, and get that control that we need to make the right choice, here comes Satan. You know what he says to you? Right when you're stuck in the middle of that temptation and you're just about to move one way or the other? He said, go ahead. Go ahead and engage in that behavior. You're going to get mad. Lose your temper. Get ugly. Because God loves you. He accepts you the way you are. You know that. His grace is sufficient for you. God knows that you have a little weak area here with that person. 
God knows that you have a tendency to make a mistake when you're faced with this kind of temptation. He loves you with an everlasting love. And don't forget, when you sin, the Bible tells you that he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So the enemy's on our case talking all about the love of God and the grace of God and how it would be okay for you to just continue along that track. Until you yield. And the moment you do or say or behave in a way that is contrary to the word of God, the enemy shifts gears without a clutch. You know what he says next? You worthless sinner. You dirty dog. He puts guilt and condemnation in our face, fills us with all kind of shame, tells us we're never going to amount to anything, we're never going to have victory in our lives, never going to be able to be the kind of Christian that we're praying and asking God to make us. And he goes on and on and on, telling us that now God is displeased with us, he's going to remove his favor and blessing from us, and we're never going to experience another blessing from God. And a couple days later, when something doesn't go your way, guess what? You believe it. You say, what's the use? God must not care about me. God must have removed his favor from me. You know what you do? You go in your closet and you get out that old grave clothes suit that you took off a long time ago, and you put that back on, you start living life the way that you used to live. It's how the enemy operates in our lives. And so let me go back and repeat what I said just a few moments ago. When we're trying to assess this whole subject of control and how we're supposed to act, and when we're supposed to take charge, and when we're supposed to surrender, you can't make or maintain control with grave, grave clothes on. Those have to come off, and you have to take them away, get rid of them, don't even give them away, just burn them. God wants to give us the ability in every situation to make the right choice, not only controlling the decisions we make, but surrendering fully to him when need be. All right, let's bow our heads and have a little time of prayer. In just a few moments, the worship team is going to come back and we're going to sing a closing song, but just before they do, I want, to, I want you to take just a minute or two and think about what I just said. I want you to consider this whole subject of control and how it relates to you. You know, all during this message, depending on where you're at in your relationship with God, the Holy Spirit has been speaking directly to your heart. You know, oftentimes we hear uh, someone will say, you know, I felt like I was the only one in the room and God was speaking to me. That's because that's what usually happens. We pray that the Holy Spirit would be here and that he would speak to us what we need to hear. He lined 10 people up and they all heard 10 different things. I want you to consider what the Spirit of God is saying to you when you hear the word control. What does that mean for you? You know, here in Michigan, Usually at this time of year, because of the lake effect, we experience a lot of gloomy, gray, cloudy weather. I mean, other than a few minutes this morning when I was on my way to church and maybe a peak of sunshine yesterday, we haven't seen the sun here in Michigan in days. We wonder if it's even still there. Whenever people complain to me about the temperature, whenever they say to me, you know, it's too cold, it's too cloudy, it's too snowy, it's too rainy, it's too whatever, and we love to complain, I always respond the exact same way. I say, as good as we are, we can't control the weather. 
You know, the weather is outside of our control. And friends, I think we spend way too much time thinking about, stressing out, getting hung up on, and be even, even becoming anxious about things we can't control. It's time to relinquish that control to God and understand we can't control everything. This year, what would your life look like if you could lay down the things that you try to control that you can't and you would focus in on the things that you can and then yield and surrender to God what only he can control. Things that he's saying and things that he's doing in your life. I think our lives would be a lot more meaningful and full. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place today. From the time that we started worshiping, Lord, you reminded us that you're a good God. You have a good plan for us. Even the theme that you impressed upon, Phil, that you're with us, Lord, even during the uncertain times. You walk us through the valley, the shadow of death. You never break covenant with us, Lord. You never abandon us. You are always with us, and you have good things in store for us this year. Whether at the end of the year we can say it was a good year or a bad year, though we know it, it was a positive, profitable year because you are God and you are always in control. Lord, you're in control. We don't have to be in control. As we continue along with this series, Lord God, these next few weeks and into February, as we take a look at the person in the mirror, us, me, Help us, Lord God. Help us to come to terms with who we are, to accept ourselves, to acknowledge, Lord God, that you want us to be made in your image and likeness. And help us to embrace the prayer, Lord, the deep desire to surrender to you with everything that you show us, everything that you reveal. Uh, deliver us, Lord, from the tragedy of looking in the mirror, seeing what has to change, walking away, and not doing anything about it. We yield, Lord. We surrender control to you where it's not in our, our power to do anything about it. Thank you, Lord, for the areas of our life that we can control. And thank you for those that we can surrender to you and to each other. We pray that you would minister to the congregation in these closing moments, Lord, we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.